When's the murder mystery start? Well, ladies and gentlemen, Benoit Blanc has done it again. And by that, I mean Ryan Johnson has done it again. Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery, and let's just be clear, it should just be called Glass Onion, or Glass Onion, a Benoit Blanc mystery, is another fully engrossing film that really lets you abbreviate on the core ideas of a murder mystery. A film that pulls into question the core ideas of a murder mystery by giving us what we expect. A multi-layered story with twists and turns that can keep you guessing the whole time, while also being completely transparent. A true Glass Onion. Onion. And if you know what a glass onion is going in, you will be even more amazed by how marvelously Ryan Johnson is able to utilize his storytelling tools in crafting this mystery. Glass Onion is the title of a 1968 Beatles track, and it was intended as a joke from Paul McCartney about people who read too much into the band's lyrics. Fans have theorized that Glass Onion is a metaphor for something both multi-layered and transparent, somewhat proving the point he was making, something that would have layer after layer peeled away only to realize that it was transparent all along. Something that doesn't mean more than what it already is. This transparency is in no way a bad thing though. It's the infraction point of the entire film as a matter of fact. It's what allows Johnson to comment on society and how so many people in positions of power are in fact as fucking awful as they appear to be at first glance. From politicians promising an eco-friendly approach to their campaign when in reality they are the same faux progressives backed by capitalists with agendas, to insecure roid raging man babies who got caught selling rhino boner pills to kids over the internet, and the commentary on billionaires and their downright abuse of the power they have. Just, gah, it's so good. If Knives Out took a knife to the throat of old money and their nepotism babies, Glass Onion breaks out the guillotine to eviscerate the current age of new money and, <laughs> well, let's face it, intentional or not, it's an absolute takedown of Elon Musk as well. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. The pre-definite detective, Benoit Blanc, is at the center of this spiral showing us the lunacy on display. The way in which a mystery like this is handled, the layers and how to unwrap them. And while Benoit Blanc is unwrapping his newest mystery, you can unwrap the gift of premium sound with Raycon. Their wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer custom comfortable fits, hi-fi audio, and up to 54 hours of battery life. Enough to get you through the entire weekend. I'm not playing dead the whole weekend, dude. This is truly delightful. And whether you're getting them for yourself or as a gift for that special someone in your life, you've gotta love that they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. You can even knock that list out all at once and get 30% off by shopping Raycon's holiday bundles. Whether you're listening to music or giving Knives Out a rewatch, do it in style with Raycon's. Come on, take a page out of the Benoit Blanc style book. You're always going to get the best deal when you use my special link. Buy raycon.com slash filmspeak. So click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash filmspeak to get 20% off site-wide or save even bigger and get 30% off Raycon's exclusive holiday bundles. There will also be different deals coming throughout the season, so I'll keep the description box updated with the latest offers. But just so you know, you can always go to buyraycon.com slash filmspeak to get the best deals and solve the elusive search for the best quality earbuds for the most affordable price. And when you're buying Raycons, you're not only helping the channel, but you also help yourself find your perfect audio product for the holidays. And thank you so much to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Embreviate. That's not a word. It sounds like a word if you use it in the right context, and with enough confidence you sure can trick people into thinking it's a word. But it's not. You put your faith in me to tell you the truth when you clicked on this video, and yet, right out the gate, I said a word that means absolutely nothing. This is what we do as people. We have tendencies to trust, have faith, think that those in power, those we listen to, are doing what's best for us and are mostly being truthful, when in reality, that couldn't be farther from the truth, and Glass Onion knows that. It's a film that calls into question and outright scathes the intelligence of these eccentric tech billionaires who come across as genius disruptors who are going to make the world a better place and shape the future, whatever the fuck that that means, but the reality is, if you listen carefully, closely, you'll find that they're absolute f 
fucking idiots. We give them way too much credit and it's actually sad. It makes us question our own intelligence for thinking these fools are who they claim to be. It's a culture of personality, the revival of the snake oil salesman. No one's really listening carefully to what these eccentric billionaires are saying because they're so good at hiding it and masking their intelligence and no one questions them because of their large fortunes, resources, power, supposed success and notoriety. And even when they get caught with their pants down, we think they're these nefarious, villainous masterminds who have these elaborate schemes and God, we want it to be true because at least that would be smart. At least they'd have motives, be smart enough to execute something that complicated, but alas, the reality is, it's so, 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 so much dumber. They're totally oblivious to what it is they're actually doing. It's all a vanity project. They don't even have the brains or the imagination to concoct a brilliant master plan. These people show you who they really are, day in and day out, and the faux intelligence, the needlessly complicated extravagance and verbiage is all a facade. These people are just idiots. We've been able to see all of this in real life too. With the meltdowns of people like Trump, Kanye, Elon, the Kardashians, that gives us this window into how stupid the people at the top of the food chain really are. I mean, there are those of us who have always been skeptical enough to see the writing on the wall, but when it gets exposed to a wider audience, it is always so so sweet. It's so vindicated. Films like The Social Network show us the machinations of these weirdos, how they are always making the worst choices and seeing how they can manipulate others from those choices. Or even the real life destruction of Twitter we've been able to see right in front of our eyes hour by hour. Elon bought Twitter and burned it down in just a couple of weeks, laying off hundreds of employees, making the stocks of the company plummet into oblivion and creating bullshit systems on the site that no one likes, no one is asking for, and yet everyone was like, oh, Elon, he's gonna, he's gonna revive Twitter, he's gonna make it a great place because this guy is a genius, and yet he's showing you what he's always been, and that's a fraud. And not to get sidetracked too much here, but the release of Glass Onion couldn't have come at a better time. The foresight, it's unreal, it's almost prescient to think about how this film was written and shot a couple of years years ago and you know just knowing these insane tech billionaires for who they are you know Ryan Johnson was like yeah you know something like this definitely is within the realm of possibility and uh you know here we are. But the fact of the matter is, it is amazing to watch a real life event line up so miraculously with the events in this film. This one idea, the idea of clear, is the same thing. We see the hubris of someone literally destroying their empire and reputation, along with those who have backed him along the way. As Miles Braun's glass onion literally burns to the ground, we witness the loss of his empire and reputation. Just as Twitter's imminent destruction brought about a true flame tailspin of the Elon Musk dynasty. Not that, you know, he really had much of a dynasty beforehand. We all, we all know this guy sucks, right? Like, he's pretty much the definition of a snake oil salesman. Come on, come on. But if we're being honest, all of this skepticism towards people really hit a high point when Trump was elected president. Oh! This dunce getting put into the highest position of power in the United States really allowed us to question the intelligence and capability of those in power. Now, we're in a bit of a better place where we don't just accept the facts willingly, we process them. We unravel our own mysteries of these people so that we can question their intentions. Now, the 2010s definitely brought about a lot of these questionable tech billionaires, and we could start to see the trajectory of how we would get to these people who are giving us everything that we could possibly imagine, and even some stuff we didn't know we needed, and we thought they were so insanely smart, so brilliant, and then they kind of divulged into, uh, you, you know, what we eventually see Miles Braun becoming in this film. Sometimes you gotta call a spade a spade, and more often than not, these people show you who they truly are every single day. There's no deeper meaning to it all, they just kinda suck. The idea of these idiots is one of the core ideas of Glass Sun. From the opening of the film, we see how the eccentric stupidity of these people is playing out. An elaborate invitation is sent out to tech billionaire Miles Braun's closest friends a puzzle box that, on the surface, is quite elaborate. There are several puzzles inside each that have a very complicated answer to unlock the next puzzle, but they are all just unrelated nonsense. The box is a box of bullshit. 
minutes, which is why after a long buildup, after watching the puzzles be cracked and the minds be tried to get into this stupid thing, we cut to Janelle Monet's character. She sits in her garage, staring the puzzle down, not even having tried to open it, and then she does what all of us were thinking. She takes a hammer and she smashes it to pieces in an incredibly cathartic way. A ridiculously complex thing that, at first, you're enamored with, such as many of us were on the first watch of this film. The genius of the puzzle box distracts you until it's taken apart in mere seconds, showing how transparent all of this game truly is. It's just a stupid, nonsensical puzzle to send a bunch of friends an invite to a party. It's that simple. The extravagance is an overcompensation. Miles projects sophistication until you really take a look at him. He's just another glass onion. The last person we see receiving the box is Benoit Blanc himself, having retired to his bathtub for his long stay in lockdown. He's in desperate need to stretch his detective muscles, and staying locked inside his house playing video games is mind-numbing to him. In Blanc's own words, I'm very bad at dumb things. A line which is just a funny quirk for a genius detective who's really bad at Clue, but ironically speaks to his inability to solve the case at hand later on. So when the opportunity arises for Blanc to accompany his rich tech billionaire and his elitist friends for their murder mystery to help solve his boredom, which is very representative of how so many of us write these buffoons off as being amusing, inadvertently giving them more oxygen than they deserve, which leads to them buying even more into their own bullshit and just kind of expanding their presence. He's excited. And that's another genius part of this film. While Ryan spells out the formula up front with the boxes, he carries out the first act as a traditional murder mystery. We are very dubious as Blanc's arrival wasn't planned for and we're experiencing these people, their relationships, the whole journey through the eyes of Blanc at this point in time without the prior knowledge of him being in on the mystery from the start. See, he wasn't anonymously invited to the island. He planted himself there to get to the bottom of the murder of Andy and is working with Andy's sister, Helen, to sleuth, gather information, and find the pieces of evidence that will clear her sister's name and help indict one of these disruptors for the murder of Andy. All of the people invited to the island, all of Braun's friends, are people he has in his pocket, people who owe their success to him and have good reason for wanting him dead. So while trying to play the murder mystery game set up by Braun, Blanc and Helen go around trying to find the motive and opportunity that every everyone would have for wanting to kill Andy. Something that these people would want to present to Braun to show their loyalty. Because you see, Miles and Andy started this company, Alpha, together. One night, while at their favorite bar, The Glass Onion, again, Braun can't even come up with the idea for his own island without ripping off something or someone else. Andy wrote down on a napkin this formula that gave them their kickstart to success. As the business grew, Miles wanted to start investing in a new energy source called Clear, with a K because nothing can just be normal when you have billions of dollars. It's something that's made from reclaimed seawater that could be a new power source for the entire world. The only downside is that if it gets into your air ducts or gets anywhere near the slightest spark or flame, your house will go up like the Hindenburg. So Andy tries to take down the company, make it so that people can be safe, but in the court case, Miles wins. He has their friends lie all so that he can get the power and resources he so desperately craves. It shows the methodology for the entire film, commenting on how the elites stand on the shoulders of people of color, women of color, stealing their genius, using them for labor, and then discarding them when they become more of a liability rather than an asset, or really when they just have no further use for them. Andy is denied the basic human decency of the truth. She, like so many others, is robbed of so much that allows these leeches to succeed. And this actually makes Lionel a really interesting contrast to Andy. Lionel was instrumental in the development of Clear. His science mind, his resources, and he's constantly putting out fires, playing PR for Miles, and making excuses for his really f***ing dumb ideas, such as child equals NFT, which I, I guess kind of worked out because of a meme stock. And regardless, Braun is clearly using the idea of sustainability to lure Lionel in, to get him to work to create this 
fuel, and Lionel is well aware that it's not ready, that he needs more time to test it. So, you know, we see Braun basically willing to cut ties when it gets to that point, or, you know, throw Lionel under the bus when he no longer needs him. We can see how Lionel is starting to be in a similar position to Andy, and it's only a matter of time before Braun tramples over him and takes credit for his genius. It's just a great way of showing how Braun has a tendency to use people of color for his own personal gain. The incestuous relationship between tech, politics, celebrity, media, influencers, science, all of the people in positions of power in our modern capitalist world, and they all answer to the interests of the dangerously juvenile and narcissistic billionaire who's financing all of their endeavors and using them as leverage to get what he wants. And it's not like they're happy about it. They're just complicit in it because they don't want to let go of their one lifeline in case anything bad happens to them in case they need a bailout or they need financing for their next endeavor. I mean, we see this clearly with Kate Hudson's birdie, who misses the time when Braun was just that little thing in the palm of her hand, when she had control over him, and she was the most important thing in his life. Now, the tables have turned, and you can see that none of them like having to answer to Miles Braun, but they're too cowardly, too comfortable to do anything about it. They don't care that it affects someone else's livelihood. They just care about themselves. They're selfish. In the words of Helen, they're not the disruptors, they're just the sh when this eclectic group gathers for the first time in person, so much is said through their wardrobe alone, and particularly the way in which they wear or don't wear their masks. Catherine Hahn and Leslie Odom Jr.'s characters, Claire and Lionel, are more reserved. They're calculating. The ones who actually worry about the ongoing pandemic. They wear safe masks that cover their entire face and comply with the six-foot restrictions put in place by COVID-19. Although, even Claire has a classic case of wealthy white suburban mom, allowing her mask to fall down her face, showing she's wearing the mask performatively. To show she's following regulations, present the illusion that she cares, but in actuality, she doesn't. I mean, if she really cared, she wouldn't be on a getaway during the height of a pandemic. Then, when Kate Hudson's birdie shows up, her mask is lace, providing no protection whatsoever and showing off how she doesn't have a care in the world about anything really. It's a fashion statement. I mean, we kind of knew this before, considering the fact she was throwing a massive rager during the height of COVID, but, uh, you know, this is just another, <laughs> another way of showing that she is oblivious. She does not care at all. And at this point, I'd like to take a moment and thank Kate Hudson for fucking rocking this part. I mean, she reminds us of the incredible talent she is because Birdie isn't as easy of a role to pull off as it may seem. <laughs> kind of the, uh, you know, inverse of the glass onion. Boo! It's such a difficult role because it could have easily slipped into absurdity, could have been played too stupid or too simple, but she finds the honesty in that performance. Birdie is genuinely as airheaded as she comes across, and Hudson manages to keep the performance authentic throughout without diluting the satire, which is a massive feat. Then there's Dave Bautista's Duke, who doesn't wear a mask and quite frankly doesn't give a f overcompensating for his insecurity and projecting a facade of rogue truth teller and male dominance advocate. And the irony of that being, he does his whole show out of the basement of his mother's house and is still slapped across the face for being an absolute fucking idiot, even though he thinks that, oh yeah, men, they're rightful places at the top. We've always been there. We appreciate women for who they are. Nah, dude, nah, come on, come on. You're being bossed around by your mom. We all know who you are. He's a hilarious blend of Joe Rogan and Alex Jones that Batista sells with so much conviction. And on top of that, knowing that he was a former esports player and was so insecure with that that he felt he had to dive deep into being this giant moronic beefcake is just the pineapple on top. It does a great job of showing that these big alpha men are really just ashamed of who they are and who they've always been and so they have to do stuff to make up for it. They have to go on these weird crusades that they probably don't necessarily believe in but they've just committed so much of themselves to that it's become their entire personality. Ultimately, this group couldn't be more diverse but still, all of them couldn't be more vain, more focused on their own self-preservation. They suck from the teeth of Miles to watch out for themselves without an actual thought about 
about what they're tying themselves to. We get this juxtaposed with Andy, who is called a loser simply for having stood with her morals. She didn't fall in line with this spineless group, and because of that one choice, she's ostracized, left out to dry. Her genius, her genuine talent, her life is taken from her, and it's used against her by this group of imbeciles. Miles Braun is an idiot. He didn't even write his own murder mystery. He outsourced it. Blanc goes through all the traditional proceedings of a conventional murder mystery only to solve the case in a matter of minutes over dinner. And the real whodunit begins. A whodunit that you want to be complicated. You want to peel back the layers and find a juicy center that will keep you thinking forever. But that's not what Ryan Johnson is doing here. He completely deconstructs our ideas of a murder mystery through the lens of this glass onion. It would be too obvious and too stupid for Miles to have killed Andy. After the enormous court cases and public fallout of the company, it's literally the stupidest choice for any person to have ever made. But Miles' dock doesn't float. His fuel of the future is a bust. His disruption theory is remedial at best. Like everyone, Blanc assumed Miles Braun was a complicated genius, but Miles Braun is an idiot. Of course he was the one who killed her. Blanc assuming that Braun isn't an idiot, that he wouldn't attempt a murder after the trial. That's Blanc's preconceived notions of this person. That's him giving them way too much credit. And truthfully, it's our preconceived notions of not only the character, but so many in power. And yet, Blanc had literally solved the case with his intuition. His greatest flaw was believing in the fairy tales woven from someone like Braun. But this responsibility can't rest solely on the shoulders of Miles. In the court case for Alpha, all of the disruptors lied and sided with Miles. They said he came up with the formula on the napkin. They saw him write it. In making these choices, they take Andy's life away from her. They out her from the company that is founded on her ideas and eventually, lead to her death. Blanc and Birdie have an interaction in which Blanc says, it's dangerous to mistake speaking without thinking for speaking the truth, to which Birdie responds, so you think I'm dangerous? This sharp pain of idiocy runs throughout the characters in this film. Blanc's observance and sharpness allows him to shatter Miles' seemingly complicated facade, only to be confounded by being stumped by a group of people who continue to insult his intelligence by being far dumber than they seem. Helen is able to solve the murder of her sister using the same system that's found in the board game Clue because it's just dumb. They're trying to manufacture a narrative or a conspiracy, a bit like QAnon. It's funny because the QAnon people are obviously f***ing morons, but they speak with such conviction and false intelligence that you almost understand how someone could fall for their trap. I mean, I did say almost, like, <laughs> let's make something clear here. At first, it seems brilliant because it's something no one has ever really thought of or considered, and <laughs> uh, there's a reason for that. It's stupid. But give it a second look, and it's just utter nonsense. This group of elite is filled with the same mind-numbing pontification that makes you buy into their convoluted scheme. If you can really even call it a scheme. <laughs> Disruptors recognize each other, Miles says. Except, uh, no they don't. It was Andy who brought this pack of losers together, and he fails to recognize, nay, acknowledge that, because let's be real, it weakens his self-image in his mind. Plus, these so-called disruptors are all in his pocket. That's what brought them together. It's what's keeping them together. The whole idea of capitalist disruption, breaking a norm or a convention, something people are tired with already, and then sliding in there to seem like a genius. Keep pushing. Can you break the thing? Are you willing to break the thing. That's not disruption, that's just exploitation. It's exploiting the state of the culture and world. If people are pissed about you doing something dumb that affects them, there's probably a good reason for it. You aren't changing the world, you're just satisfying your ego and childish need to agitate for attention. Kinda like a certain someone we're watching destroy a prominent social media platform right now. Miles is an opportunist. He exploits and takes advantage of everyone and everything he can, hence the Mona Lisa. The Louvre was in desperate need of financing because of the pandemic, and so here comes Miles, who's gonna take advantage of that and rent out the f 
f***ing Mona Lisa because of course he did. He has no imagination. Even his big dream of being mentioned in the same breath as the Mona Lisa lacks originality. It's the most basic, absurdly stupid thing he could have imagined. Again, he is who he says he is and people gave him too much credit. He wanted to exploit a timeless piece of art for his own vanity project with Clear and have it mentioned in the same breath. That's not disruption. You wanna know what real disruption looks like? Look at Helen and what she does to expose Miles, blowing up his house with his own fuel and taking the Mona Lisa down with it. His fuel of the future exposed as what it really is. You wanna know what real disruption is? Well, Ryan Johnson tells you that real disruption is doing something to shatter the system. Break up the status quo of people in positions of power being in bed with new money billionaires who act like they're shaking up the system, but in actuality are doing the exact same thing idiots in positions of power have been doing for years. Helen is hiding in plain sight for the entire movie. She is a constant disruption to the plans of Miles. She is the envelope at the center of the glass onion, smoking gun, the only thing that can bring down Miles' empire of lies. She has blocked on her side, but as he says, he's not Batman. He's nothing more than a facilitator of the truth, whatever that may be. He is an ally in the truest sense, but obviously one with limited reach. Yet still, all of this gives us a catalyst for justice to be carried out. The unfairness of the system, the way in which characters gaslight each other, all ends in a perfect f you to the snobbery and elitism of the upper class, and Ryan toys with the idea of gaslighting quite a bit throughout the entire movie. I mean, Miles literally lights the evidence that would take him down on fire and demands that everyone in the room tell his side of the story because, oh yeah, you didn't see it, you didn't have the evidence, well I'm gonna be a little baby, I'm gonna play this game, and blah, blah, you know, ah, fuck him. Ryan blatantly shows you what Miles does to kill Duke and then twists the truth to show Duke grabbing the glass instead of Miles handing it to him. He's constantly gaslighting the guests and by proxy, the audience through the narrative as to what they think is happening. It's a mystery that you can solve just by barely paying attention, but still, based on how we expect these events to play out, we can't fully piece it together. And that's just brilliant filmmaking. Blanc keeps returning to the glass onion. Like most people, he expected complexity, intelligence, but it hides not behind complexity, but in mind-numbing plain sight. In this same message, these ideas are what Ryan Johnson is clearly, with a K, getting across to us with this film. It's a film about truth, about cutting through all the bullshit to get to the truth of what we know, what we see in plain sight. And after this film, I think it's pretty safe to say that Ryan Johnson is our most online filmmaker. And yet, his movies never feel like they use that subsection of a genre or something that will date the narrative. They definitely feel of their time, but that's okay. It's a snapshot of culture without exploiting the culture. The internet is part of our culture, so why actively ignore it? The larger message and theme are timeless and that's really what matters and will help his films stand the test of time. But he delivers the information through a cultural lens which is brilliant. It makes his work have more of an unflinching bite. He doesn't mince words. He is a disruptor himself. By setting the audience up in this idea of an elaborate murder mystery, he is able to show us how we are perceiving our own reality. The glass onion we all live in. Almost nothing is that complicated. It seems complicated. It could be worded in a way exclusively designed to confuse you, but when you actually peel back all the extra padding, you see a world that's run in the most absurd way possible. It's almost a modern version of 19 1984. I mean, not to that extent, but you get the same kind of thematic pursuits, pointing out who the big brother of our modern society is and how they've been manipulating all of us. We can finally see behind the curtain. What is a more blunt way to show this than actively burning the Mona Lisa because of the pompous attitude of Miles Braun? His incredible lack of smarts led to the destruction of the most famous painting in the entire world. His hubris led to a world in which he thought he had it all and had total control over what was at his disposal. But that's not true. That's never true. It's like putting a loaded gun on the table and turning out all the lights. This line, this idea that Braun steals from Blanc defines 
every action he has taken in his life. He hears something, he takes it, he executes it, he thinks he will get away. The only problem, once you see that this is happening, you'll be able to poke thousands of holes into their plan. Once someone is willing to even just throw a small comment out there about how stupid these actions are, everyone's eyes are open. Ryan Johnson is scathing the idiocracy on display in front of all of us on a daily basis. He does it in a brilliant masterpiece of a film. Like genuinely one of the best scripts I've ever had the pleasure of seeing performed. Of a film that, while being a glass onion, still has so many things to say about the world we live in. It's not just surface level, it's not just transparent, it's powerful. And now Ryan Johnson is giving us that power. The power to tear down the stupid notions built up by the rich that we have had to live in. Now it's just up to us if we act upon it or fall into the palm of our boneheaded billionaire overlords.